Hello and uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Once again, I'm going to be alone over here today too, without Hermi. I mean, the guest is definitely going to be here, a young and energetic and a wonderful photographer, Subal. And this is going to be slightly different than our usual sessions. If you're talking about wildlife and animals, this is going to be a completely magical world on astro so you're going to see a lot of stars and planet and you're going to hear a lot from him and he's not only a photographer he is also making things to you know apply in his field that's what is going to make this journey even more interesting so none other than our wonderful photographer zubair is going to be our guest let's welcome him hi zubair hello hi Richard. You... thank you so much for inviting me I'm good. How are you? Invite. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Of course, my pleasure. My pleasure. So yeah, uh, this is gonna be pretty fun. Uh, I actually haven't done any of this thing for a long time, so um, kind of nervous. <laughs> that's okay. That's that's a part of game. I mean, in fact, I I go through this process almost every day. The beginning is always a bit slow, but then it get the pace. Yeah, we we are like astrophotographers like us. We're very, what do you call it, introverted. So um, there's not a lot of people around us most of the time. So yeah, this uh, I, I'm sure this is going to be fun. It is. It is going to be fun. So how about you giving us some insight on how did you got into this? What made you fall in love with skyline and uh, night photography and the stars and this magical world altogether? All right, so um, we have to start from the very beginning, I guess. I mean, um, I always loved the night sky and the stars and the moons and everything. Um, I remember when I was really young, uh, I actually have a part of like uh, some some stories to tell and I have a presentation made for that. Uh, we'll get into that, but uh, I've always been interested in, in, the, in the space and um, it is always very fascinating to see these tiny dots so far away, but we can still see them. So uh, I've always been very fascinated about that. And um, I'm, I would say like this is a curse and a uh, blessing at the same time. I'm interested in a lot of things. This is, this is one of those things that I'm uh, getting back to. So um, by profession, I'm not an astrophotographer. Um, mm -hmm. It would be pretty awesome if I could make money a living out of this thing, but it is not the case uh, at this moment. It is my hobby. Uh, professionally, I am um, a filmmaker and an animator. So digital art is my thing. Um, oh, I've been great. doing this for, yeah, for a long time now. Um, professionally from 2004 and um, just learning things from the early 2000s, uh, 98 onwards. Um, so it's it's been most of my life. Like I started really young with doing my profession. It was a hobby at that time. Um, and then somehow it became my job. It, it became my life. But uh, the thing is, you have to expand your horizon into different things that you are always interested in and then get, get maybe get back to it or reignite that flame, you know? Um, so yeah. with astrophotography, that is kind of uh, what I'm trying to do. Um, you know, going back to my early days in a way. So this is very exciting for me. That's wonderful. So Rima. would you like, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, would you like to jump into the uh, presentation? Yeah, that would be great. So let's, let's do that. Okay, yes. Can you see it? Yes, if you can make it full screen, that's great. Yeah, perfect. Is it full screen? Yes. Okay. So, great. Um, so, uh, hello, and I'm going to talk to you guys about my astrophotography journey. Um, here's just a, a quick disclaimer that I cannot really see myself. So, it is just yeah, me funny. and Nisha's, Nisha's voice. So, yeah. anyways. Um, yeah. So, I wanted to start with this image uh, because... Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of what I've been doing for the last almost two years. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a composite of everything that I've captured, but I'm gonna go through one by one and tell you guys all about it. 
So um, let's go from the very beginning, 1998. So I was oh. a dorky kid, um, very interested in, a, 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 interested in a lot of things. And one of oh. the things that I was very interested in was um, space. And I remember um, having this book um, and in it, it had this uh, diagram of how to make a telescope, very simple telescope. And telescopes are generally simple um, unless you uh, get into you know, the nitty gritty of it. Um, but the idea was to have an objective lens and an eyepiece, you know, put them in a tube and you can focus and you can see distant stuff. And so I, I, I did that. I was, uh, I think I was 12 years old at the time. And uh, I went to a optics store, like a spectacle store, um, and ordered an, a, a glass, uh, a lens, a two lens, actually, the objective and the eyepiece, put them together and, uh, you know, made a telescope out of cardboard tubes. And my wow. mom was at that time doing some kind of uh, architecture, interior design um course and she had a lot of these tubes lying around you know papers uh, paper tubes or uh what do you call it she used yeah. to put the plants inside it so i i stole one and <laughs> made this thing <laughs> and it, it was pretty pretty awesome like i, I could see uh, you know uh, the stars very close and one of the things that um that i loved seeing was the moon and uh, pleiades I, I have an image of it later on um, so it was super fascinating at that time, but I was not smart enough to make a tripod. So I was always <laughs> holding it like that and trying to, you know, stay stabilized. And uh, it was not very fun, but um, I, I had a lot of fun making it and I still cherish that memory. And I promised myself at that time that mm -hmm. when I grow up, I'm going to make a proper telescope that I can see, you know, really dist distant things. And I kind of forgot about it uh, after, oh. after a while. Um, I got into animation and um, programming and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that basically took, up, took all my time. And I pretty much forgot about making a telescope and um, getting back to space. Uh, but uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. um, well, not 2019, let's... let's I'm going to share something a bit personal and um, it basically changed me as a person. Um, okay. In 2018, my grandma passed away and okay. uh, she was very close to me, um, you know, after my mom, like sometimes when I was growing up, um, I, I really enjoyed her company and um, sometimes more than my mom, but uh, mm -hmm. I love my mom. But anyways, um, so when she passed away, it, shook me to to my core and um and uh, you know it it raised some question that how can we make our existence more meaningful and um more fulfilling and mm -hmm. the things that we always wanted to do do we need to do it because time is running out because that is the only thing we are born with time so if we don't use it um mm -hmm. to to do all the things that we enjoy or that brings us meaning then we're just wasting that time so we cannot do that so i started experimenting with a lot of things that i was really interested in when i was a kid like mm -hmm. i started with uh learning electronics from zero like i remember at that age 1998 it was a very interesting year for me i got my first mm -hmm. computer um mm -hmm. i uh you know i made my first telescope uh I, I i used to do a lot of drawing and painting at that time so it was a very interesting experience because at that time i remember like we're going through a pandemic right now right so mm -hmm. in 1998 there was a flood in in bangladesh and for mm -hmm. almost a year or was it almost six months or a year? Uh, everything was kind of in lockdown, like not mm -hmm. like social distancing, but we uh -huh. couldn't go to school. Uh, I was doing homeschooling. I had a lot of fun, a lot of free time. So I used to do all these things. So mm -hmm. anyways, at that time, I was also interested in electronics. So I started mm -hmm. doing that in 2018, uh, mm -hmm. started learning everything from the basic, uh, made a bunch of things. Um, mm -hmm. I started doing 3D printing. So wow. um, I had some time at that time, so I, I used that to the best mm -hmm. of my ability. So in 2019, um, mm -hmm. I saw some post uh, maybe on Instagram and 
So uh, I saw some YouTube videos. Uh, one of mm -hmm. one of the channels were Trevor's channel, Trevor Jones, uh, called Astro Backyard, um, mm -hmm. and some other channels. And and I saw these people taking mm -hmm. pictures of galaxies and nebulas and yeah. nebulae. Um, and I was like, wait, Hubble, mm -hmm. you need to have a Hubble telescope to do this yeah. kind of things. You can yeah. actually take pictures of a galaxy from, from Earth, from the ground, from your rooftop or backyard. And that got me thinking, like, this is something that needs to be explored. And I always wanted to find, like, new projects to do. So I thought, like, okay, uh, since I don't know anything about astronomy, astrophotography, or any of that thing, I'm going to go from the very basic. Like, uh, I started thinking, what would the early astronomers do? Like Galileo or uh, William Herschel, um, you know, Copernicus. Like, all those ancient, not ancient, like, uh, early astronomers. Yeah, yeah. Like, they would start from, from the basics. Like, knowing the sky, observing the sky, learning the night sky, learning how to make telescopes. So, I'm like, okay, I, I made one. So, let's take this as a project and mm -hmm. make a proper telescope. So, I started thinking about... Okay, let's make a visual telescope that I can, you know, put an eyepiece and see if um, see distant objects. And that um, that idea got away pretty soon. I'm like, no, I want to capture this, right? So yeah. uh, by that time, I haven't started making the telescope. So I was just gobbling up all this information, all these videos that I can find on YouTube, and. Um, and yeah, I was just learning so much about this thing and learning about the details and advanced stuff, uh, stuff and everything. But I haven't started taking any pictures. So in September of 2019, um, mm -hmm. I went to my rooftop. I'm like, okay, I, I kind of understand how this works, but mm -hmm. I don't have a tracking mount or telescope. So I'll just put my telescope, uh, put my camera uh, on a tripod and see if I can capture anything. And okay. I captured this. All right, so uh, this is my first attempt at astrophotography. Um, wow. I learned that uh, there's a region called uh, the Cygnus uh, constellation, and there is this bright nebula called the North America Nebula because it looks like North America. I'm sure you have no idea, like, where's this North America? No. But when I saw <laughs> there's this faint, um, uh, faint glow, this red glow of nebula, I was like, yes. This is possible. Like, if you put the right time and energy and um, and um, what do you call it technique, then I think this is very possible. So this is my start of astrophotography. Um, I didn't know where I would go from there, but um, it got me hooked. Absolutely hooked. So uh, let's see what's next. So here's me uh, designing my telescope. So um, I, I um, designed the whole thing in a CAD software. Um, so I have a lot of experience with 3D modeling, 3D animation. So the transition okay. from you know, making something for television or advertisement or you know, just creating an art and translating yeah. the, that knowledge into product design was not very difficult for me. So uh, I got a head start there. Um, so the only thing that was different here was everything needs to be measured. Everything needs to be uh, need to apply to the real world because we're going to print this. Um, mm -hmm. So later I printed this, the, the parts and the tube is made out of um, PVC, uh, plastic mm -hmm. tubes that you can find in a hardware store. So I bought that, you know, printed all these um, parts. Uh, uh, bought the objective lens, so this one is a little bit better than my first uh, telescope when I was 12. Uh, this had two elements, so this is basically a 500 millimeter um, camera lens, um, but you, you can do manual focusing. Uh, as you can see, there's, this, there's two telescopes actually, one big one and another riding on top of it. So yeah. they have their, they have their um, uh, what do you call it, uh, functionality. So one is what you image with. So if you're taking a wildlife photography image, uh, like in a, in a jungle, you would use this long telephoto lens, right? So the, mm -hmm. the uh, main imaging uh, telescope is that 500 millimeter lens. And on mm -hmm. top of that is, uh, we call it the guide scope. And mm -hmm. its function is to lock onto a particular star and uh, we also use a, a camera, small camera. It's called a guide cam 
Um, mm -hmm. It's like basically a webcam that you can connect it to your computer and your computer basically calculates the position of a star and sends uh, a signal to your mount. Uh, and the mount is very important. I'm, I'm going to come to the mount a little bit later. Um, uh, it, it, it basically sends data to the mount and it tracks the sky so uh, the stars don't trail. Um, oh. Astrophotography is very technical, so uh, uh, yeah. it, it gets pretty pretty technical very soon. So uh, bear with me, all right? I'm going to try my best to uh, make it accessible to everybody, uh, but I will I will explain all these things. All right. Thank so uh, once I designed the the telescope, um, I had to print all the parts, right? So I 3D mm -hmm. printed all the parts. This is me. Um, Kind, like not me, the telescope um, kind of sh taking shape. So as you can see, the the tripod looking thing, the green object and, and, and that whole contraption is a tracking mount or uh, a star tracker. So its okay. job is to basically track the night sky. And um, mm -hmm. if you think about Earth rotating uh, on its axis, um, mm -hmm. We know that rate, right? It takes 24 yeah. hours to for Earth to spin once, 360 yeah. degree. So you can use that rate and you know put a motor and connect it to uh, maybe a controller that rotates the motor in the in the same rate that Earth's rotate, right? But on the mm -hmm. other way, okay. so it can track the sky. But you need to align the uh, axis of that motor uh, mm -hmm. to the north celestial pole we call it the north celestial pole it is where the star polaris is uh, mm -hmm. it's the north star right um, yeah, north so star. it is pointed toward the north star so um, when the motor rotates it can rotate the telescope to follow the star and the stars mm -hmm. will not trail so that is the uh, job of this tracking mount and it is very important to get this first uh, because astrophotography is all about taking really long exposures and um, and when you take long exposures of the stars without a tracking mount, they will trail. So this eliminates that problem. So I bought this thing and um, before I made the telescope. So um, okay. I kind of understood how, how that works. Uh, okay. So when I made this telescope, as you can see, the whole thing is not yet ready. Um, the parts are being put together. Uh, I put the rings on, the dovetail on, the focuser was half made. Uh, this was December 26, 2019. And something interesting happened on that day. So I stayed up all night. On the In, in the morning, I had this tendency of looking out and see if the sky was clear, even in the daytime, which was like obsessive of me because astrophotography was a thing for me. And like, I was like always excited. It, it was new, it was fun. So I was looking out um, from the from my window, and I saw this. So this was the eclipse that happened uh, in 20, uh, 2019, uh, 26th wow. of December. I don't know if you got to see it. We yeah. had a partial e eclipse. Wow. Yeah, parts of India had, um, uh, you could see the annular e eclipse, like the, um, it, it wasn't a total eclipse, but an annular eclipse where you can mm -hmm. see the ring around uh, the moon. <clears throat> so it was my first light from the telescope. And I was like, okay, we're off to a good start. Um, <clears throat> a lot of things were not aligned properly that, you know, you see this uh, kind of um, weird lens flare um, mm -hmm. because I didn't have a solar filter at that time. I put a really uh, strong ND filter and it, it was just put together like, I didn't even attach it. I just put it inside the lens hood and I just hope that it worked. Um, but I ended up taking some pictures and I w luckily it was cloudy. Like astrophotographers never associate luck with clouds, but I was lucky that day because clouds kind of dimmed the light of the sun. So my camera mm -hmm. didn't really burn out. Uh, so yeah, this was my first uh, uh, photo that I've taken with my homemade telescope. That is wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. So moving on from here, um, here's here's my telescope again. Uh, this time I put um, a, an eyepiece on it. So this is this looks like a 
regular telescope that you imagine when you think of a telescope. You know, there's an eyepiece, you look through it, you see the moon or the stars or whatever. Um, I, I wanted to do that because, hey, you know, uh, you have to um, do some kind of visual astronomy. But recently, I, I don't even know where my eyepiece is. I, I think it's lost. <laughs> it's there <laughs> somewhere, but I don't know. Uh, I usually, you know, it's all, my camera is always attached to my telescope these days, but um, I, I do enjoy uh, looking at uh, uh, the stars or the moon through an eyepiece. It's always enjoyable, but, you know, if it's a clear night, I don't want to waste it uh, just looking at it. I want to take pictures of it. Anyways, um, so moving on, that night um, I took this image of the, of the crescent moon. Um, this was a treat as well because it was so thin and I never, never really looked at the moon um in this uh, crescent form through a telescope i mean before i made my telescope i never really looked through a proper telescope before uh, okay and the the one that i made when i was 12 that doesn't count that was <laughs> not a proper telescope it didn't even have a tripod so yeah so this was uh, very very fun Okay, so here's my recent rig. I mean, I don't know if you can see my telescope behind me. Uh, it kind of yeah. looks like that. I made some uh, improvement uh, to the current one, but this is what my rig looks like right now. So mm -hmm. in the middle, you see the Star Tracker. Uh, it is a Skywatcher Star Adventure Pro. Um, it is very basic. Um, it, it tracks only in one axis. Uh, which and it doesn't have any go-to. So if you want to find an object, you have to know where it is. Point your telescope and pray that it's it's in your viewport. Um, and and now I ha I use some other techniques, uh, so it is easier for me to find it. But um, uh, like it, still, like it is very difficult to find targets with this rig. But um, what I believe is limitation teaches you a lot and I didn't want to jump into this thing you know just spending a lot of money um, you know and and be spoiled I wanted to take the hard road um, the bumpy road uh, where you know I, I I could understand how optics work I and I, I had to understand how tracking works and all that thing and it is very rewarding because I do have plan to make a tracking mount myself. Uh, but it's gonna it's gonna take a while. Um, I I do have have some parts, but kind of got lazy and my 3D printer is out of order, so uh, okay. can't do it. And in a pandemic, fixing things is terrible. Um, okay. Another thing is I yeah I ordered um, a tracking mount, not a tracking mount, a go to mount where you mm -hmm. it's a robotic mount. You put an object, put it put the name of an object. Put, press a button and the telescope basically moves uh, toward it so you can image it but i ordered that last november i still have <laughs> haven't got oh it uh, still waiting for it <laughs> yeah welcome to 2020 to 2021 <laughs> <laughs> so i hope it gets to me soon um i heard that they shipped it finally okay. still fingers crossed let's, some, let's see some good news goes. yeah so this is what I image with. Um, as you can see, there's the guide scope on the top. Um, there's a lot of wires coming out. It is um, the imaging is controlled using a computer. So uh, in a regular photography scenario, whether you're taking uh, you know street photography or um, any other kind of photography, you put a camera. Uh, you sorry, you put a battery in it, right? And then yeah. you snap the uh, snap the images but in astrophotography um, because the exposures are so long usually um, a minute 30 seconds to a minute to three minutes maybe sometimes five minutes for me it is very difficult to go up to five minutes but um, I could do up till um, three minutes so uh, when you do exposures that long your battery kind of drains out really quickly so I had to put a dummy battery and put it in a, um, you know, connected to a uh, power bank, and and then control the imaging through a computer, um, mm -hmm. so I can check each image, and um, and you know, just keep a track on the session, basically. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna go super deep into it uh, because it's gonna be very boring very soon, but um, maybe some uh, future session. But I'm gonna go give you yeah. guys an. So that's my rig. 
uh, let's talk about images. Like, sorry for you know taking so much time uh, no, on fine. introducing everything, but no. now is the fun part. Then... We get to see the images. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what I love about the night sky is all of it. So I'm um, I'm kind of an um, astrophile. Um, I'm not really a selenophile, but you know, a lot of people recognizes my work through my lunar images. Mm -hmm. I love the moon, taking pictures of it. But I, if you ask me what I love the most, um, is is the deep sky, because there's so much wonder in uh, in the deep of the of, of space. You can see galaxies, nebulas, and everything. So um, there's two kinds of uh, there's like two um, what do you call it. Uh, categories of, of space objects. Like one is deep sky objects and one solar system objects. We call it DSOs and SSOs. So DSOs are the nebulae, um, the galaxies, the star clusters, and all that. So uh, these are light years away, like not just a couple of light years, like hundreds of thousands of light years away. And the galaxies wow. are millions of light years away. Uh, so these are the ancient lights. Like uh, on the left, you see the image of the Orion Nebula. I'm going to um, uh, talk about it later more. But that nebula is like 1,500 light years away. So we are wow. looking Ooh. in the past 1,500 okay. years, like over 100,000 years. And um, on, the, on the right, of course, uh, we all know it, the moon. Um, uh, the, the, the object that we have in our solar system um, you know, obviously is called the solar system objects. And that is also a category of things that I like to take pictures of. So we're going to start with uh, the deep sky objects. All right. Okay. So here's, here's a capture of the Milky Way um, from last year. It's not the best image I know because my skies are terrible. And because I can't really travel around, I cannot go yeah. to the dark sides and take really br brilliant uh, images of the Milky Way. But um, why I have this image is because to give you, um, you know, sort of a map, an idea about where things are. So this is, we're looking at the core of the Milky Way and there's a lot of interesting objects here. All right, so we're gonna focus on a couple of them. So um, this is, um, this is the, and uh, we can see there's some smudges, right? There's some red smudges, and we're gonna yes. um, zoom into that region. Right? Okay. So we see a lot of dust here, and and here's oh. the uh, here's the interesting thing. You might say that Zubair, this image is very noisy, right? Yeah. Yeah, but this is not noise. Every pixel is a star or multiple stars. Oh my so god! So the noise that you see are mm -hmm. not like really, no yes, there's some noise, but most of the dots that you see, they are an mm -hmm. individual star or multiple stars. Um, and you can see a lot of cloudiness. These are the interstellar dust. Um, mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the, we cannot really see the core directly because there's a lot of material in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of gas and, and particles. Mm -hmm. um, but in that region, it is called the Sagittarius region because there, the, it is where the Sagittarius constellation is. Um, there are some uh, there are some uh, really interesting nebulae. So if you see on the on the lower part, uh, there are some uh, smudginess, right? Uh, there's some bright smudginess uh, in, in that region. Uh, we're going to focus there. So here's uh, the highlighted part. Uh, do you do you see? Uh, some some fuzzy stars over there? Yes, yes, I do see. Yeah, so uh, these are nebulae. All right, so let's zoom in there. Okay. So this is the Lagoon and Triffid Nebula. Um, wow. Lagoon Nebula is also known as M8. And um, the take a picture of the moon. Um, you can definitely take pictures of uh, the nebulae. Um, the galaxies, on the other hand, are a bit different. They're very, very far away. Some of them can be very small, uh, mm -hmm. but we're going to talk about them in a bit. So this is the uh, Lagoon Nebula. This is one of the most brightest nebula uh, in, in the sky. And you can see a lot of interesting structures uh, on the bottom. Uh, there's a star cluster in the middle. Uh, it is a very beautiful region of space uh, near the core 
of the Milky Way. And the Triffid Nebula is also very interesting to me uh, because mm -hmm. there's some really interesting filaments happening there. So let's move on. Yeah. So we're going to look at this other fuzzy object. Um, and I actually, I'm not really happy with any of these images because I want to take more uh, time and um, and the longer you expose these objects, the more details you can bring bring out. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the image I'm going to show you is of uh, the Omega Nebula. So okay. this is the Omega Nebula um, M17. Um, this is also a very interesting part because uh, there's a lot of hydrogen gas. So in the last image, um, you saw a lot of red, right? So yeah. there's a lot of red here as well. And this red light is coming from hydrogen gas. Okay. Right? So hydrogen gas, when it is ionized, we mm -hmm. call it H2. And when hydrogen is ionized, it emits a, a light in the red spectrum. Um, okay. And uh, it, our cameras can uh, uh, can capture that. But there's a, there's a caveat to that. Um, the cameras that we buy of the of the shelf, um, mm -hmm. say a Canon camera or Nikon camera or Sony, they have a filter right in front um, of the sensor that blocks this wavelength of light. All right. Okay. So what I had to do is I actually use a Canon 600D for all these images, deep sky images, mm -hmm. because I actually have performed an uh, operation on the camera. I had to yeah. take it all apart. Uh, expose the <laughs> yeah expose the sensor and take okay. out that IR filter infrared filter so when that filter is gone you can actually capture the light that is emitted by hydrogen gas so that is okay. the light uh, that we see here so you are not only so playing with your uh, telescope you are actually altering your camera as well Yes, we kind of have to. Um, you okay. can buy dedicated astronomy cameras. Um, they're almost the same price as uh, regular cameras, but they have really powerful cooling. So the sensor mm -hmm. is in the negative temperatures, like minus 5, minus 10, minus 15, 20. Uh, when the temperature is really low, your noise becomes very diminished uh, because mm -hmm. most of the noise that we get on our camera sensors, these mm -hmm. are from heat. So okay. you, since I don't have a dedicated astro camera, camera because of yeah. the pandemic, um, yeah. I, I didn't want to code it. Like, yeah, pandemic. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't get one. I, I actually saved up the money to buy one. I mm -hmm. uh, contacted a lot of stores that want, uh, like, uh, who sell them. They cannot mm -hmm. either ship it or I cannot get it from anywhere locally. It is not available. Like in Bangladesh, um, astronomy or astrophotography is still not a big thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know a lot of people who does this. So, you know, I'm stuck with my modified camera. Um, since it's not cooled, the, I have to deal with a lot of uh, noise. So anyways, let's move on. Uh, here's another uh, very uh, famous nebula. It's called the Eagle Nebula. It is right above um, uh, the Omega Nebula. So mm -hmm. let's see that. Um, this is the this is the Eagle Nebula or M16, and this is one of my favorite targets in the night sky. And it aches me to tell you that I cannot really image it um, uh, that much because you know uh, if you if you know that our region is susceptible to a lot of rains because we have monsoons. So yeah. the sky is always cloudy. It is always raining. And I know it is right there just waiting to be captured. And I cannot do that because of the clouds. But uh, I captured this um, last year. It is just maybe one, one and a half hours of exposure. Um, in the center, there's the famous pillar, Pillars of Creation. Um, I actually don't have an image of that, but Hubble telescope made it very famous. Like whenever we think about um, space and Hubble telescope, we mm -hmm. see this uh, region of space. It is called the pillar of creation. Okay. So let's move on. All right. Um, so this is another famous region and very interesting region uh, of the night nice sky. It is on the, on the plane of our galaxy. Uh, but it is a bit far, far from 
the the center of the Milky Way. It is called the Cygnus region, the Cygnus constellation. And mm -hmm. there is some beautiful nebulae in this region. And uh, like the like the other image that I showed you before of the core of the Milky Way, every dot in this picture is a star or multiple star. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a huge um, complex of uh, dust, particle, gas, uh, ionized gas. Um, there's a there's an exploded star, a supernova remnant, um, mm -hmm. and on the uh, top uh, left you can see the North American nebula. This is the first image that I've ever taken. Remember the image I, I showed you in the beginning? That yes. is the region uh, of space. So oh. this is taken with a 50 millimeter lens. Oh. So if you have a 50 millimeter lens and a camera, you have no excuse. You can just go upstairs and you know on your roof or backyard or wherever, and you can shoot uh, deep sky objects. Uh, and the, 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 these nebulae are very far away. I think the North American nebula is uh, 7,000 light years away. I'm not sure, but uh, it, is, it is quite far away. So you can you can image these things, and these are very big um, region of space. Um, so even with a 50 millimeter lens, you can get a lot of details. Uh, this is also about one, one and a half hours of exposure. Mm -hmm. um, so the bright stars that you see um, in the middle top and mm -hmm. uh, on the right, um, <clears throat> the bright star is called Deneb. And mm -hmm. the less brighter star on the right is called Seder. And, um, you know, if you, if you can find or locate these stars, then mm -hmm. you can find uh, these nebulae. And this is why understanding or knowing the night sky or the you know, sky in general, it is very important for astrophotography or astronomy because you need to know where things are. Like yeah. I remember I had no idea where things were um, in, in, a, in a TV show or maybe in a movie, maybe there's some astronomer pointing at the star and like, yeah, this is that star. But like, how did they do that? Like, how did they know this star is that yeah, star? That's so, true. right, it is very confusing. But once you start locating the constellations and understanding what is relative to the other thing, like what, what constellation is relative to another constellation, then you learn which of the stars are which. Then you kind of get an idea about um, the night sky. You start creating a map inside of, of your head. So that is why if you are interested in astrophotography or astronomy, start with knowing the night sky. It is very fun. You don't need to buy anything. You can just go you know, under a clear night sky and start locating different constellations and start uh, learning about it. So anyways, uh, I'm going to share a couple of images uh, about these objects. Um, let's start with the North American uh, North American Nebula. So it is called the North American Nebula because it kind of looks like the uh, American map, right? You can see, yeah. you know, the Miami area or Mexican area. It kind of looks like that. So that is why it is named after the North America continent. Um, I love this nebula and I want to, you know, take more images of it. And uh, there's a thing in astrophotography. It is called integration. Integration is like um, how long are you taking, um, like how long of exposure are you taking of an object? The longer exposure you take, the more detail you can capture. And we don't take one, one uh, hour long exposure. We take multiple shorter exposures, like one minute or two minute long exposures or three minute long exposures maybe take 50 or 100 of them and then combine them together. We call that stacking. And we're going to go into that uh, in a bit. But the longer you do that, the clearer the images and the more nebulosity you can capture, um, the more light emitted from this gas is available mm -hmm. to you. Anyways, so this is the North America nebula region. And here's a zoomed in version. So you see that, um, you know, where, where Mexico would be. So there's a thing called the Cygnus wall. And it is, it is a bright region of, uh, of the nebula. And um, that, this image was captured using a 200 millimeter lens. 
-huh. And this was captured using my telescope uh, that I've built, uh, the uh -huh. 500 millimeter lens. Um, okay. So here you can see more details uh, of the Cygnus wall and more um, nebulosity. Wow. So let's, yeah. So let's move on. Um, here's another interesting part of this Cygnus region. So uh, there's this thing called, um, oh my God, what is it called? Uh, the Cygnus loop. <laughs> Sorry, okay. the Cygnus loop. Yeah, the Cygnus loop is basically a supernova remnant. So a long time ago, uh, mm -hmm. maybe a couple of thousands, thousands of years ago, uh, mm -hmm. there was this star that exploded and all mm -hmm. the matter uh, the star had was scattered uh, around that region. So uh, I haven't captured the whole, I, I have captured the whole thing, but I'm not very fond of that image. So I'm gonna show you part of that image. So this okay. is the um, Eastern Veil Nebula. And this is one of those waves. If you see, uh, if you think about the star exploding, oh. then you know there's, there's this matter that is being pushed. So th this is one arm of that matter. And you can see some red and some blue these are from different gases. So okay. uh, there's some oxygen that is represented by blue light and okay. red is the hydrogen light. My God, it's, it's so unbelievable. Yes, and these are like uh, thousands of light years away and these are uh, tens of light years across. I cannot give you the exact uh, number of, uh, uh, exact number of light years. Uh, that it is across, but it is it is multiple of ten. So these are huge objects in the sky and very faint. The the only reason we cannot see them with our naked eyes is because these objects are very very faint. So you take hours of exposure to bring out these details. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that was the Cygnus uh, region, and uh, here we have the Orion complex. This is the most recognizable constellation in the night sky, especially in the winter seasons. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever seen the three stars that rises in the winter? Yeah. And uh, there's some fuzziness in the in the uh, you know underneath that. Um, yeah. So that part is called the Orion complex, the Orion constellation. And um, the, the center three stars is called mm -hmm. the Orion's belt because it is, if you see, like Orion is a, a hunter, right? So in Greek yeah. mythology, Orion is a hunter and um, he is depicted uh, in the sky in this constellation. And there's this interesting thing about Orion and the scorpion because, you know, Orion was always very arrogant about uh, him um, he can slay any beast or whatever. And mm -hmm. I think it was, uh, it was a Greek goddess. What's her name? Um, what is her name? Uh, Athena or something? I forgot the goddess's name, but one of the goddesses uh, got, uh, got very angry by this arrogance of Orion. And mm -hmm. she sent him a beast in the form of a giant scorpion uh, and the scorpion fought with him and the scorpion won. Uh, oh. He was killed, but he was such a great hero that he was depicted in the stars uh, and he got his, his own constellation. So a little bit of um, Greek mythology there as well. Um, okay. So the scorpion and Orion, these are two constellations mm -hmm. in the sky. So, you know, Scorpio, Scorpio is one of the zodiac right wow. so when orion rises scorpio mm -hmm. uh, the constellation is on the other side of the sky so you don't see that because the sun is blocking mm, the constellation mm -hmm. of scorpio but uh, when the scorpio constellation is visible orion is not because the sun is blocking the light um, okay. from orion so in the night time when you see orion the constellation you don't see scorpio and when you okay. see scorpio you don't see orion so this is like the scorpion is chasing Orion. Orion is chasing after the Scorpio. <laughs> it is like an interesting, um, you know, Please. celestial play in the yeah. sky, mythological celestial play. So anyways, this is a very interesting region in the sky as well. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly here. Uh, I, I know this is getting very long, but there's a lot of things That's to fine. share. Um, yeah. So the, because this is the Orion constellation there's this famous nebula called the orion nebula and this is the uh, this is one of the most famous nebula um, 
among astronomers, every beginner astronomer starts with Orion. Um, I also started like one of my first astro images were of Orion, and um, it is very bright, and that is why it is very accessible. Like if, even if you have a 50 millimeter lens, which mm -hmm. this image was taken, and mm -hmm. my city is very light polluted, so a lot of noise, not a lot of grain. Please excuse that. I'm just using this image um, as a map, right? Where things okay. are. So this is the Orion constellation. There is the Orion Nebula. Let's do, mm -hmm. zoom into that. So this image was taken using my telescope and uh, with a 500 millimeter telescope wow. that I have uh, right behind me. And this is the Orion uh, Nebula. And the, you can see a lot of gas, right? right? This definitely looked like something you created using your artistic skill. <laughs> Yeah, but you know you can prove it that this is uh, this actually exists. You, you can yeah, you know yeah. uh, find a clear night and point your camera at the Orion Nebula and take a picture, and you can confirm that this actually exists. And here's the weird thing: a lot of people have questions about are these pictures real, dude? Yeah. You know, uh, and sometimes yeah. people ask me like, "You're an animator. You're a digital artist. Maybe you painted this." Uh, I wish I did. Like that would be pretty awesome. But you can actually take images of this thing yourself and prove that these are real objects in the night nice sky. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, they're very enigmatic and mysterious. You can see a lot of interesting shapes and structures in it. These are light years across. In the sky, the Orion Nebula is actually bigger than the moon. So you can fit a full moon inside the Orion Nebula. So this is one of my favorite nebula as well because it is so bright and so pretty. Upside down, it kind of looks like a lotus, but I like this orientation. It's beautiful. And, um, on, thank you. On top of this nebula, uh, the, the one that looks like a flower bud, that is the Orion Nebula. And on top of that, it, uh, that nebula is called the Running Man Nebula because if you look deeply, you can see like kind of like a cave painting of a man running so that's why it's called the running man nebula all right so let's move on to the next target um so in the orion orion's belt uh there's this very interesting region of gaseous matter uh, and we're going to look into it and that star uh that bright star is called um al nitak um, and a lot of stars are named by the Arabs because there was a lot of early Arab um, astronomers who would study the night sky and, uh, you know, a lot of names um, are, are Arabic, like Al-Nilam, Al Al-Nitak, um, then there's um, uh, Saif and then Al-Jabbar, like all these stars are Arab, like uh, Altair, these are... Arab names and it is pretty interesting that you know how names kind of stick and we still use that um, so let's look into this region so this is another of my very very favorite nebulae um, in the night sky it is called the Horsehead Nebula um, and the Flame Nebula it is like in the middle you see this structure right it looks like a horse's head and that's why yeah. this nebula is called the Horsehead Nebula it is a dark like nebula, fire. so there's a lot of gas. Go ahead. It looks like fire. It does. It does. Uh, and that that uh, tree-like thing on the left it is actually called the flame nebula. So it does look oh, like okay. a burning bush. Like yeah, to me, like if I were to name this, I would name this the burning bush nebula or the burning tree nebula. But it is called the flame nebula, which is also good. Yeah. So um, another interesting, uh, what do you call it, information about uh, these images is um, these are taken with a filter that only lets in the hydrogen and the oxygen wavelengths. So mm -hmm. um, it is kind of like a narrowband image. Um, if you could have eyes the size of a football field and if you can, you know, take in all these photons, then you would see uh, more colors here because the star, star would have more colors. Um, you'll see a lot of this red and you, mm -hmm. your eyes needs to be sensitive to the hydrogen wavelength 
which our eyes are not. So mm -hmm. it is um, when you ask, like, can I? Can you see this with your own eye? Can you look into a telescope and see this? No, you can't. Our eyes are not powerful enough to um, see these things properly. Even with the, with a really big telescope, um, mm -hmm. you'd see gray scales, not a lot of colors. But when you take um, deep exposures of these things, uh, mm -hmm. you start um, you start you start to see all these different colors, like red, blue, and whatnot. Mm. Okay, um, this is another of my favorite nebula. I mean, most of my favorite nebulas are here. Okay. Um, this is called the Rosette Nebula. Uh, sometimes mm. people see it as a rose, but yes. I kind of see it like a skull. Can you see the skull? I I see it like a, a you know some uh, what do you call this? Uh, you say that there is a vanishing point in the sky. So if you're going to have a flower around the vanishing point, then I think I'll picture it more or less like that. It's not just a rose, but it's leading to somewhere into a different world. <laughs> yes, like a portal. Yeah. Yeah. But if you look, then you can see like two eyes, two eye sockets. There's a crack on one of the eyebrow. Um, there's a nose socket. There's a weird cat-like mouth so to me it always looks like a skull yeah but yeah this is also that, a hydrogen rich yes <laughs> yeah so this is this is also a hydrogen filled nebula i think i got the ngc number wrong oh my god but anyways let me just check i don't want to be wrong with my ngc number uh nebula. just give me a second Oh, it's not 4488. It's NGC 2244. I always get get it mixed up. But um, yeah, this is the Rosette Nebula. Let's move on. This is the Cone Nebula. It is actually very close to the Rosette Nebula. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting fact about this image, <clears throat> excuse me, is that um, this is an 11-hour, more than 11-hour exposure. So what? Uh, taken, yes. T I, I, I had to take images of it for maybe four nights or five nights. Um, so yeah, after exposing for 11 hours, I finally got this image. This looks so, like a um, um, divine figure right in the bottom, slightly up, like maybe three fourths of the frame. You may feel like somebody standing there with a star on his or her head. Yeah, it does look like that. Um, since it's the cone-shaped thing, it is called the yeah. cone cone nebula. Um, there's a lot of interesting structures there. Uh, I mean, I, I I look at this image and I see potential. I don't see like this is the best image that I could have taken, but um, I have to keep in mind that my skies are not that great, and I have, you know. My gears are not that great either, but I was really happy to see that some of the structures were resolved in this image. Let's move forward. Uh, this is the Seagull Nebula, another beautiful nebula. Uh, you see these um, nebula in, in the winter season. So uh, if you know where the star Sirius is, Sirius mm -hmm. is the brightest star in the night sky. Uh, and you mm -hmm. see this, you see the star uh, in the winter time. So it is, close to the Sirius star. Uh, mm -hmm. It is called the Seagull Nebula. It's, it's, it's very pretty, I think. Um, uh, to me, it looks like a pterodactyl. Uh, you know, those early uh, Jurassic birds uh, okay, with, yeah. you know, claw-like uh, beaks. Yeah. So it kind of looks like that to me. But I really love this. And um, again, a lot of hydrogen. So when you see red, um, mm -hmm you have to assume that this this color is coming from hydrogen gas and in our universe hydrogen is the most abundant um, element uh, our our sun is full of hydrogen helium yeah. and other things but mostly hydrogen uh, these nebulae are uh, filled with hydrogen gases uh, most of it uh, a lot of oxygen is there as well but i could i didn't really capture the oxygen light um, but here's this here's a fun fact so when you see this nebula, you see a cloud of this red uh, gas, right? You'd yeah. see, uh, you'd guess that these regions are very dense. 
And when you, if you have a starship and you go through it, you know, you see all these red hydrogen uh, all over you, but you wouldn't. So mm -hmm. here's this, here's this interesting fact. Imagine a cubic centimeter, right? Yeah. A cubic centimeter of space mm -hmm. in space, in this nebula. You'd find maybe, if you're lucky, a hundred particles, hundred atoms, or maybe a thousand at best, right? In the most densest region. So a hundred atoms, um, that's a lot, right? Yeah. Okay. Compare it to our atmosphere in this room. In a cubic centimeter, there are trillions of atoms, trillions of atoms. So compared yeah. to our atmosphere, these mm. nebulae are practically empty. Like if our best vacuum on planet mm -hmm. Earth, like yeah. if you create a very powerful vacuum chamber, mm -hmm. it cannot go down to the density of this nebulae. So imagine how faint these objects are. And that is why mm -hmm. it takes so long to capture them and so difficult to capture them. Okay, and here okay. comes the galaxy. This is the Great Andromeda Galaxy, um, and it is the closest galaxy to the Milky Way. It is 2.5 million light years away, right? and it is mind-boggling that what you're seeing is literally trillions of stars in one image, and more than trillion stars because there are three galaxies here, one in the center, another yeah. fuzzy galaxy, the lower yeah. Uh, part of the image, and there's this bright star right, uh, right next to the gal Andromeda galaxy. That is not a star. That is also a satellite galaxy of Andromeda. So you're seeing three galaxies: one major galaxy and two satellite galaxies in one image. Trillions of stars. Okay. I mean, not not trillions, like <laughs> one point five trillion, maybe. So uh, it, is, it was thought that Andromeda is bigger than our Milky Way, but okay. new studies say that uh, Milky Way is bigger than Andromeda. And it is actually heading toward us. So okay. um, in a couple of billion years, Andromeda and Milky Way is going to merge and form this new, maybe an elliptical galaxy. Uh, not as pretty as uh, Andromeda and Milky Way right now, but mm -hmm. it's going to be very interesting. But, you know, four and a half billion years, we don't have to think about it right now. <laughs> we can just look at these galaxies and yeah. appreciate their beauty. True. These galaxies are called uh, spiral galaxies, grand mm -hmm. design spiral galaxies, because you can see spiral arms. Um, mm -hmm. This was in my bucket list for a very long time. I remember like uh, September 2019 when I started, uh, mm -hmm. I went to this... Um, this beach town of, of Bangladesh called Cox's Bazaar. And the sky was kind of cloudy, but I had some opportunity to test out. I took mm -hmm. uh, an image untracked, like without any tracking or whatever, just put my camera on a tripod, located the galaxy, took like a 15 second exposure and I saw this fuzzy galaxy and it blew my mind. Like I could see a galaxy um, from Earth. Like that was very, like that. that just told me that, Yo, you need to take a picture, a proper picture of this galaxy when you uh, when you can. So this is still not proper. Like I want to work on it more, but I'm happy that uh, I could capture this. And this is almost seven hours of exposure time. Oh my! Maybe more. I don't remember. <laughs> At least seven hours of exposure time. So yeah, a galaxy. And the next image is gonna blow your mind it, because it blew my mind as well. Um, okay. This was also taken from last year, uh -huh. uh, March, when just before the the world shut down, I went okay. to my grandparents' house um, um, to show respect to my grandma. And um, there uh, I took my gears and the sky was better than the city, Bortle 3. So Bortle mm -hmm. is a scale of how clear the sky is, how uh, better you can see the deep sky. So Bortle 3 is very good. Um, our city, is, like where I live right now, it is Bortle 5, but okay. it is it is kind of um, air polluted. The air pollution is really bad, so it's always hazy. Uh, so Bortle 3 is a lot better. Um, so from there, I took the next image. And mm -hmm. 
here it is. So it is very underwhelming, right? I hyped it up so much, and you're like, yeah, superstars. <laughs> what is this guy up to? All right, here's the fact that's going to blow your mind. So you see these fuzzy things in, yes. the, in the center? Yes. And all, all the other kind of fuzzy stars all around, most of the dots, yeah. they're galaxies. They're not stars. What? Yes, and each of those galaxies have billions, hundreds of billions of stars. So oh this God. is called the Markarian's chain. It is in the Virgo constellation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this image gives me vertigo, literally. I'm like, I cannot take in this scale. This is so big. Each of these dots, they're galaxies. Everywhere you look, there are some stars. There are a lot of stars, but all the reddish fuzzy dots that you see, yeah. all, all of them, galaxies. Oof. So just, you can just look at this image and you can tell yourself that, hey, you know, that, that friend who was mad at me, you know, the, the colleague who was, you know, causing trouble uh, at my job, uh, my boss, all this problem in my life, they don't That's matter. Nervous. It doesn't matter at all because it is. we are so small so in the scale of this cosmos. Because when we look out into deep sky and when we see this kind of scale for ourselves, it's very humbling. It makes us yeah. think like, okay, everything is okay. Everything is going to be all right. You know, uh, the, everything is beautiful. Let's look around, enjoy this, uh, enjoy yeah. our time and be happy. Like this gives you a perspective how small our life is, how little time we have and how little time we have to enjoy it. So why not try to do that? And yeah. in these dark times, it is it is very important that um, we think about existence. We think about um, the bigger picture. Uh, it is something that will also ground us and give us some kind of comfort. Uh, mm -hmm. Some For some people... It is very problematic or troubling to experience time in this kind of scale because all these galaxies, mm -hmm. there are hundreds of millions of light years away. So yeah. every every dot that you see, there are at least 20 million light years to 200 or 2 billion light years away. <clears throat> That's how old these lights are. Mm -hmm. So kind of mind-boggling and um you have you have to breathe in and let it out just to <laughs> absorb this kind of space time <laughs> so yeah um this is one of my favorite images but i want to go back to this um again and take mm -hmm. more exposure so i can expose more details uh this is in my bucket list all right Great. so here's a here's a concept that i'm going to talk to you about mm -hmm. um about true color and false color imaging. So like mm -hmm. I said, a lot of people ask me, is this real? Can you see this? Is this mm -hmm. color real? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's two answers to it, yes and no. Okay. So it's, it's like a quantum state of answer, yes and no. It's both <laughs> zero and one. How? <laughs> so on the left, you see a true color image. So this is taken with my modified DSLR camera. Okay. And this is taken with a taken with a wide uh, wide angle lens, 50 millimeter lens, and you can mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, see a lot of red, some whitish, grayish color, some um, bluish, greenish color. Um, these these are the spectrum that is captured by the sensor. All right. Okay. There is no filter attached to the camera, so this is the real light. All right. So all the structure that you see, these are all real. The colors are real. If our, our eyeballs are the mm -hmm. size of like a football field, then we would be able to see this. But it's not. <clears throat> on, the, on the right, um, it, is, uh, it is a very interesting target, by the way. Let me give you a little uh, idea about that. It's called the Thor's Helmet uh, Nebula. Uh, nebula. Oh. Um, it is it is very small. Uh, it is way smaller than the moon. Um, mm -hmm. I actually, I took this like I took this image using a telescope in Chile. So I hired mm -hmm. a professional telescope um, and and bought some time telescope time and mm -hmm. um, got this data and processed it. 
Um, okay. So the, this is a very interesting target for me because it looks very interesting. It's small. I cannot really capture it because my telescope is not uh, powerful enough or it is not magnifying enough to capture mm -hmm. this in detail. Uh, mm -hmm. But the professional telescope is really good. And after I process this, this data, I start cursing my gear and I wanted to throw my telescope away because this data was so good. Uh, because, you know, that telescope is like, I don't know, like $20,000 or something or okay. more. Uh, the, the camera itself costs like $20,000. So it's a very impressive rig. Um, okay. So anyways, um, this image is false color. So what is false color? Um, why uh, proper astronomy cameras, like dedicated astronomy cameras, uh, mm -hmm. some of them are monochromatic. Monochromatic okay. means that um, when you capture an image, mm -hmm. it gives you a it, it gives you a grayscale um, output, grayscale okay. data, uh, okay. and the way you bring out the color is you put on uh, mm -hmm. different color filters, say okay. red, green, and blue or mm -hmm. narrow band filters. So what narrow band okay. filter is, say red spectrum is mm -hmm. this big. So there, mm -hmm. there, there is kind of yellowish red to really deep red. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the spectrum of red, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the red channel. Mm -hmm. And if you um, mm -hmm. narrow that spectrum and take mm -hmm. a very tiny portion of that spectrum, mm -hmm. that is called the narrow band imaging. So where hydrogen light is, uh, if you, mm -hmm. um, so when you uh, talk about hydrogen light, it, we mm -hmm. call it hydrogen alpha. The wavelength okay. is called hydrogen alpha. Okay. So hydrogen alpha is 656 nanometers. Mm -hmm. So that is a very tiny sliver of uh, uh, spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. So when you capture in the spectrum, mm -hmm. and if you're using a monochrome camera, you're mm -hmm. gonna get a monochrome image of only hydrogen data, right? Okay. That is called narrowband imaging. So right. next, I'm gonna explain to you what a narrowband image basically looks like. Okay. So this is the Carina Nebula, also taken with that telescope. It is not my data; it is free. Anybody can download it from Telescope Live, and okay. they can play with this data. And uh, since this was professionally captured with professional gears. Um, okay. I wanted to see what is possible, and I was really impressed. And now I want to become rich and buy a really big telescope and lose all my money. <laughs> so, anyways, so there, there's three images uh, or three channels that we see here. These are taken okay. with three different filter. First okay. is, is with a sulfur filter. Uh -huh. um, it's called the uh, S2 filter. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see this. All uh, all these three images are grayscale and they look kind of different, but they're yeah. of the same object. So they're taking in different mm -hmm. um, different elemental light. On the mm -hmm. on the far left, we see sulfur. It is the mm -hmm. uh, light that is emitted by ionized sulfur atoms. And then mm -hmm. in the middle, uh, we have hydrogen. Uh, alpha channel where we mm -hmm. see um, ionized hydrogen gas data mm -hmm. and on the right we see the light emitted by oxygen or O3. So mm -hmm. these are the three data set that we have to work with, right? Mm -hmm. um, so on the next image um, here we see uh, if we assign each of those say uh, sulfur to red channel, hydrogen to green channel and oxygen to blue channel like mm -hmm. this on the top mm -hmm. we see the sulfur channel but it mm -hmm. is red and in okay. the middle we have um, we have hydrogen data and mm -hmm. on the bottom we have oxygen when we composite them like in photoshop if you have ever used photoshop you go to channel and you see this three rgb channel right these are the yeah. three rgb channel where we assign those data set get it okay. so there uh, sulfur and um, hydrogen, they're both red, but if we put them in red channel together, then green is going to be empty and, um, you know, uh, it's not going to represent the data properly, right? So okay. this is a scientific way to represent data that we can collect, astronomy data. Um, okay. It is not just a photograph, right? Okay. So astrophotography is both astronomy and photography, right? That's we, okay. why we call it astrophotography. Um, okay. So it combines those two, 
to disciplines where um, in, 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 in terms of astronomy, we see, we collect data and when mm -hmm. we produce an image, it looks like a photograph. So that's why it's called an astrophoto. So we assign these channels, uh, these um, data in different channels, and we are left with a very colorful looking image. So this image is real, but the colors are false. But from this, when you look at this image, you can, you can detect uh, or uh, figure out where different gases are. So in the middle, you see a lot of blue, that is where mm -hmm. oxygen is. Oxygen is. You see a lot of red um, on the side. That is where the sulfur is. Mm -hmm. And where you see a lot of green, that is where mm -hmm. the hydrogen is. Right? Yeah. So this, this is a representation of data that we mm -hmm. photographically collect. So okay. that's why this is very interesting. But this is absolutely real. This image is absolutely real because you can go out and capture it yourself but mm -hmm. you cannot see it from the northern hemisphere you can only see it from the southern hemispheres because okay. they're very lucky um but these pictures are very real so that basically sums up my deep sky astrono astrophotography i'm gonna move into the solar system part um which is more accessible actually uh, yeah. let's do that so Here's one of my favorite phenomenon, a solar eclipse. Um, this was taken last last year. Yeah, June last year. Uh, we had a solar eclipse. Um, mm -hmm. It was like 70% from Dhaka. Uh, since mm -hmm. I couldn't travel, I was, um, you know, I was left with that. And I couldn't see the total or annular, full annular eclipse. Um, this is... This is a part of it. Uh, this is the beginning or end of it, I guess, the solar eclipse. But uh, solar system objects are everything that is in our solar system, like planets, moons, uh, the sun, uh, et cetera. So I, I captured them as well. It is very fun because uh, sometimes because of weather, you cannot really take images of the deep sky. Uh, you need very clear skies <clears throat> and good visibility. So, but solar system objects are more forgiving. Like you can see moon, even if the visibility is bad, you can see sun in the daytime. So you can do some solar photography. Uh, the planets stay bright. You can do uh, some planetary photography, like take pictures of Jupiter or Saturn or Mars when it is close to us. So I take that opportunity as well because I'm kind of like addicted to this thing. I would take anything like deep sky, solar system, moon, whatever. So here's a picture of the moon. Uh, it is the thing that I capture most often. Um, okay. and it is the easiest thing to capture because it is very bright. Everybody can relate to it. Um, it is right up there when it's out. You can go out, out and see it. In our eye, we see some details, but when you zoom into it with a powerful um, lens, telephoto lens, you can take a lot of details. Uh, so lunar photography is... Um, is a bit, is a bit different than deep sky photography. So in deep sky, we take a lot of long exposures, right? But mm -hmm. for lunar or so solar system objects, we take a lot of exposures, but they're very short. Like they're one one hundredth of a second long or one four hundred second long. Um, okay. But we take hundreds of pictures and we uh, I usually use uh, the intervalometer built into my Sony camera. Um, okay. So my deep sky camera is uh, Canon 600D, and okay. my solar system camera is basically a Sony 6400. So that's what I use to capture the lunar and solar images. Um, so yeah, what I do is capture a lot of images, and then you have to pr process them, basically combine them to bring out all these details. If you go out, even with a thousand millimeter uh, focal length lens, and you take one shot, it's not going to capture all these details and you're going to have a lot of noise to deal with. So the biggest hurdle uh, for astrophotography is to deal with noise. So um, that's why you have to take multiple exposures, combine them together. That reduces noise because it averages out all the noise uh, from the data and you're left with a clean image that you can post process. 
So um, I take a lot of, uh, I used to take a lot of solar images. Recently, the weather is so bad, I can't even take solar images these days. But, you know, um, I don't have a dedicated solar camera or, okay. um, or solar filter, but I have a white light filter that lets you see sunspots. So here you see um, a tiny sunspot um, that, I, that I captured probably last year. Yeah. And the oh. sun's color is false. So uh, I used a monochrome camera for this. Uh, monochrome camera is in my guide scope. It has mm -hmm. a very tiny camera, tiny sensor. Um, so I can put a Barlow lens, which is basically a multiplier. Um, what, what do you call it? Like te teleconverter. It okay. is like a 2.7x teleconverter. We call mm -hmm. it Barlow lenses. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it goes between the telescope and the sensor, um, mm -hmm. and it magnifies the image. So I use the tiny sensor to capture uh, details on the sun. And I use um, a reflective kind of foil-like solar filter that mm -hmm. reduces 99.9% .9 of sun's light. And uh, here's a disclaimer. Never, ever look at the sun using any kind of lens, whether it is a magnifying glass or a telescope or a camera lens. Never, ever look at it or point your camera at the sun because it will burn your eyes if you look through it and mm -hmm. it will burn the sensor and you're going to be very upset. You're going to cry <laughs> and it's not going to be pretty. So okay. don't do that. All right. So here are some lunar images um, and these are composites. Okay. Thank you. So um, I post them on my Instagram and uh, people seem to like them a lot. So yeah. I do that. Um, I kind of enjoy it. Um, it kind of gives me this uh, astrofix, if you, if you can call it. Um, mm -hmm. I get my astrofix and I get to produce these images and uh, uh, people, uh, luckily, they like it and I'm very grateful about that. Um, mm -hmm. These are composites. So yeah. what composites mean is that I image mm -hmm. the moon and yeah. foreground or the clouds uh, separately and the stars separately. All of the elements that you see in this image, they're all photographic. Mm -hmm but yeah. they're combined. Because yeah. uh, if you want to take one single exposure, mm -hmm. the dynamic range is too much. You know, the moon is gonna be blown out. The foreground yeah. is gonna be dim. So uh, to counter that, I take uh, these elements, I capture these elements separately and expose them properly so I can create these images. Great. Uh, here are some more. Um, the, the one on the left is actually a it's kind of a composite, but I would call it an HDR because it's a um, it, it is combined combination of two exposures. One exposing the the moon, so we mm -hmm. see some uh, details on the. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is actually a single exposure. Uh, my bad. Uh, this is a single exposure. This is probably a two second exposure um, mm -hmm. of uh, and the stars that you see, the two bright star, little stars. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one of the the brightest one is Venus, and the next to it is Mars. So a couple oh. of days ago, maybe a week or so ago, there was mm -hmm. this conjunction: the Moon, Venus, and Mars came really close together in the sky, in the okay. uh, evening sky, and I took this image. So this is one of those rare images where I can just click it. You know, um, oh, yeah. I have a problem with that word clicks like we don't click astrophotographers don't click their image we take our images we image uh, the night nice sky we don't click it because you know click means you take a snap yes, and yeah. you're done with it you know you go to photoshop do some color correction and you're done but yeah. astrophotography is a bit more involved than just clicking but on this occasion the left image is in fact a click because there was a clicky sound coming from my <laughs> camera <laughs> So in the middle image is uh, another very rare event um, mm -hmm. last year. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was December 21st, 2020. Mar okay. um, Jupiter and Saturn came really close together. It, it is called the event of the century uh, okay. because uh, it is a very rare conjunction. Conjunction is when two celestial bodies come together very close and um, Saturn and Jupiter came so close that, that with your naked eye, it looked like one bright star. So that's okay. how close it came. And compared to the moon, um, I actually composited in the moon so you would have an idea how close these things are um, on that date. 
And on the right, we have another eclipse. Like this is that 70% eclipse that I was talking about. And this is also a single exposure, I guess. Yeah. Moving on. Here's a video. I don't, um, I don't know if you can see a video, but this is a video of that eclipse. Excuse okay. me, Kat, uh, if you can hear her or him. Okay, yeah, so I, <laughs> I don't know if you, if you saw it. Um, there was this interesting thing that happened in this video. While I was taking image of this eclipse, I did this video and a plane flew right over it. So it's like, a, I think it's a plane. Um, it is kind of like a UFO moment. Can you see that? Yeah, I can, can see, see Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Right? Yeah. This this dark thing that moves across the solar plane, like eclipse, uh -huh. right now. See? Yeah. It's a UFO. <laughs> Probably it's a plane, but I don't know if it is a plane, so it's a UFO. So there you go, the UFO fanatics. Here's your proof. Yeah, I mean this is this is one question I wanted to ask you because you spend so much time in the in this field. I would definitely love to get some insight on UFO from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the things that are that are called UFOs, they're no longer UFOs um, till you uh, recognize it. Or yeah. UFOs are unidentified flying objects when you identify them it becomes fo or okay. flying <laughs> objects. Okay. Yeah. so here's another image uh, a video uh, it is yeah. a time lapse actually it's a three day okay. time lapse taken on the 20th 21st and 22nd of uh, december 2020 uh, oh. where jupiter and saturn came really close oh, because okay. Jupiter and Saturn is moving in the same direction, but in different speed because Saturn is further away. Its orbit yeah. is slower. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, orbiting the sun slower than Jupiter, but Jupiter is moving faster. So it is taken, taking over Saturn. And you can see that in this time lapse. So yeah. these are very interesting things that you get to observe uh, when you get obsessed about the night sky or the space uh, yeah. or space. Here's another celestial event that happened uh, in April, April 17th. It is when there was this occultation of Mars and Moon. Occultations mm -hmm. are when celestial object passes over uh, another. So in this case, Mars uh, dipped behind or be, got occluded by the mm -hmm. Moon and came out okay. on the other side. Okay. I kind of missed the first part where Mar Mars disappeared behind the moon, but mm -hmm. I captured this uh, second part of it where Mars came out of uh, okay. the, the moon lunar disk. So I'm going to play this video. Okay. So you're going to see this shimmer, and this is the atmospheric turbulence, and here you see Mars coming out. It's very tiny because it's very far away. Yeah. But this is sped up many, many times. It says five times. I, I, I think I sped up uh, even faster than five times. Okay. It, it is. So that's the, those are, these are the I interesting days that we get to live and get really excited about. Like, yeah, there's a occultation mm -hmm. and everybody's posting their version of it. It's a very yeah. interesting community, fun community. And everybody kind of knows everybody, like who's, who's who and what, what's everybody doing. Um, I'm talking about the Instagram community. It, yeah. is, it is very fun. Okay, here's another thing that I was lucky enough to capture. Um, I, my biggest regret in my astrophotography journey is not being able to capture Comet Neowise. Everybody who's everybody in astronomy captured this comet, but I couldn't. But there was this other comet that came before Neowise uh, in 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, um, it was discovered in 2019. It's called Comet C2019 Atlas, uh, mm -hmm. also short uh, in short form at Com Comet Atlas. Um, mm -hmm. It was visible in March uh, March 2020, and mm -hmm. I captured a little uh, time lapse of it. I'm gonna. Play. So if you can see that fuzzy thing, is a comet. Mm -hmm. So that's my cons what do you call it? Consolation prize. Uh, of comet capturing 
so this is Comet Atlas wow. sipping through, and this is um, this is a time lapse of one 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 and a half hours, around thirty frames maybe thirty exposures okay. of one minute each, um, and even in in that time frame in just one hour you can see this comet moving so fast uh, yeah. compared to the stars behind it. Yes. So it is. It is very fascinating to look at these things and just be in awe. Wow, these mm -hmm. things exist, and you can actually see it. Uh, this is not something that NASA, uh, you know, it's not part of NASA conspiracy. Because if you think it's a conspiracy, go buy a telescope, buy it to you know mount, look mm -hmm. up, and start taking photos, and you'll see these things. These are not conspiracy, or you know, space is not fake. You can oh, see it. You. you can observe. <laughs> Here are some um, images that I took of different um, different planets. On the left, you see the great planet Jupiter. Um, my telescope is not very powerful in terms of magnification. Um, it is just 500 millimeter focal length with the 2.7 times Barlow lens. I can go up to maybe 2,000 millimeters with my crop factor and everything. Mm -hmm. So with that focal length, I can capture only this much detail, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy because it is, uh, this telescope is something very special to me, you know, homemade, made Definitely. with a lot of love. So these images are very precious to me. Yeah. So in the middle, you see Saturn and on the right, you see uh, Venus. And Venus is very, very beautiful because it is one of, it is the only planet. No, it is one of two planets that you can see phase shifts. So phase okay. shifts are basically what we see in moon. So moon is orbiting around the earth, right? Yes. And we see different phases of the moon. Yeah. Uh, so we don't see that phase shift in other planets. I mean, maybe some, uh, but not very extreme because uh, planets that are farther away from uh, Earth in from the sun yeah. are called superior planets because they're they're outside the orbit of Earth. We see some phase shifts, but they don't go, you know, under what do you call it? Like 50, 60, sorry, not 50, 60, 70 percent. Right, but okay. for Venus, it is closer to the sun compared to us. Like Mercury and Venus, these are closer to the sun, and okay. they have extreme phase shifts uh, when they uh, when they are say uh, you know what do you call it w when they're uh, behind the uh, behind sun or close mm -hmm. to the sun we can okay. see like only a tiny sliver like it's like a crescent moon a crescent phase of it so okay. we can see that and we see that because it is an inferior planet it is closer to the sun and we see all these phase shifts so here um, I have probably 12% illuminated um, Venus. Mm -hmm. uh, in, with naked eye, it is still very bright, but mm -hmm. when you see it through a telescope and when you process this data, you can mm -hmm. see a beautiful crescent, um, crescent shape of Venus. Okay. And here's a phase shift of Venus, different phases of Venus. Okay. So I started capturing the planet Venus back in February 2020. And okay. this is uh, starting from 18th February all the oh. way to uh, May 16th. So you can see it is coming closer to Earth, toward Earth, mm -hmm. and it is getting thinner and thinner. Yeah. So it is a relative si uh, size. So in uh, on February 18th, it was further away from Earth, mm -hmm. and it had uh, a 50% illumination. And okay. in May, it came really uh, it it came really close to Earth. And mm -hmm. it became a lot bigger in the sky. Okay. And at the same time, it became a crescent um, phase. Okay. All right. So that's basically it. And now I'm going to share some tips and tricks uh, if you want to start your own astrophotography journey. Yeah. Um, a little information about this image. It is called the Pleiades Star Cluster. Okay. It is one of those few objects that I recognized from a very early age, the telescope mm -hmm. I built. I okay. looked at this star cluster and it blew my mind and my brain was on the floor. So this, <laughs> is, a, this is one of my favorite objects. 
Um, okay. You can see this in uh, even now, if you wake up really early, like four in the morning, yeah. and it's still dark, look toward okay. the east, and you can see this tiny little cluster. All right, Great. so back to the astro tips. Mm -hmm. Learn the night sky, all right? Uh, it is very important to learn the night sky. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you start with the night sky and if you understand where things are, where the constellation is, mm -hmm. um, then it becomes very easy for you to find information about it and to have a plan to shoot it. Like if mm -hmm. you know where the Orion Nebula is or the Orion constellation is, you mm -hmm. can um, think about, okay, I want to get into astro astronomy or astrophotography. I want to capture the Orion constellation or the Orion Nebula. And mm -hmm. now you know where it is, right? Yeah. So learning the night sky is very important. But how do you know the night sky? How do you learn about the night sky? I had a very interesting experience to share. Um, many years ago, maybe 10, back in 2008 or mm -hmm. uh, something like that, eight or nine, um, I went to this island uh, with my friends mm -hmm. and we were enjoying the night sky like I got to see the most clear view of Milky Way. It blew my mind. I had no idea about astrophotography, astronomy at that mm -hmm. time, but I knew that you can see the Milky Way. It mm -hmm. was so magical at that time. So mm -hmm. I, I spent all night on the beach. And uh, at one point, me and a bunch of my friends found this mm -hmm. empty boat and we mm -hmm. got <laughs> on it um, mm -hmm. and just looked up and enjoyed the stars. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, this was mm -hmm. really early in the morning, like it was dark, it was like two or three in the morning, a shadowy figure basically popped up and asked us, who are you guys? I'm like, what? you know, just, yeah. I was like, just looking at the stars. And then I asked like, who are you? He's like, I'm a fisherman. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Uh, so <laughs> this guy was, was fishing in the ocean and he just came back to check up on his boat or something and found us, right? Oh, okay. I'm like, wow, this person in the middle of the ocean, how do they navigate? I was like, how do you know where you are, where the shore is, what time it is? And he, this is the, this is the most inspiring moment um, in my astrophotography or, or, you know, in my life. He's like, we look at the star and we can tell what time it is. Like, no kidding. No way you can do that. Like, what time is it? Tell me. He looks up, he looks at the Big Dipper, okay. and he tells me it is 3.45. I'm like, yeah, right, you dumb, dumb person. Nobody can do that. Like, I was, I didn't really believe that. Uh, but I didn't really tell him that you're dumb. Uh, I thought he was, which was very wrong of me. Looked at the watch, and it was 3.45. I'm like, you're not dumb. You're like a... Genius. master you're like you're like a genius you're one with the universe and i want to be like you when i grow up i want to look up at the stars and i want to be able to tell you what time of the year it is what time it is still not that good but getting there so this is where right. learning the night sky is so important sorry about that segue but how to learn the night sky we have apps we live in the digital age and everything has an app um, and my favorite is called Stellarium you can download it on your mobile I think you have to buy uh, the mobile version is a couple mm -hmm. of dollars but it is free on computers like if you okay. download it on your Mac or PC it is mm -hmm. absolutely free and you can see the constellation where it is. Uh, you can type in different times and see the night sky as seasons change. So this is a really, really great free tool to learn the night sky. And this is where I would start. And I did start in Stellarium or you know softwares like this, where I started mm -hmm. learning where things are and mm -hmm. went from there to uh, seeing where these things are. Because if you want to take deep sky astrophotography, you need mm -hmm. to know where the targets are. And yeah. before you buy your camera or your telescope or your lens or anything, you need to yeah. understand where the, uh, these things are. I'm really yeah. sorry about my cats again. Uh, they're going crazy. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. So this is where you start. This is what okay. I would re recommend. Great. Then comes gear. After you have some idea about the night sky, you have an mm -hmm. idea of what constellation you can see in what season. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I would 
tell you to invest in gears. So mm -hmm. one thing that you might already have is a phone or a camera. So yeah. I, um, I would call that your first purchase. You can take okay. astrophotography with your camera, uh, with your uh, smartphone, actually. Um, mm -hmm. There are like Google Pixel. There, I see people taking pictures of um, the Milky Way with the Google Pixel or mm -hmm. other phone cameras. Um, so it is very possible, very accessible. Um, if you have a DSLR camera, Perfect. If it is a cheap, like ten-year-old DSLR camera like mine, I bought it off like from this guy for under two hundred dollars. It's a six hundred D, very old, um, and I can take you know uh, Nebula and Galaxy photos with it. So you don't have to invest a lot of money in the camera. Uh, just yeah. go with whatever you have. So second thing I would recommend is buy or get a wide angle lens. So mm -hmm. uh, with the wide angle lens, you can start taking uh, pictures of wider region of the night sky. Uh, you mm -hmm. still have to take shorter exposures in the beginning because mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you why. Um, mm -hmm. So the first three things, camera, a wide angle lens, and a solid tripod should be your first three things. Mm -hmm. Okay, why a mm -hmm. tripod? Because you cannot handheld and take astrophotos. It doesn't work like that. So yeah. um, you have to put it on a very stable tripod. You have to have a wide angle lens uh, and your camera and take very short, say one second exposures and a lot of it, like hundreds, if not thousands, and then stack mm -hmm. it. I'm gonna talk mm -hmm. about what stacking is in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So once you try that, this is also how I started. I started with a tripod and a camera and a lens, and mm -hmm. then I moved on to you know uh, more advanced things. So my next purchase would, was a, a star tracker. A star tracker is that contraption that you see between the tripod and my telescope. Um, it is not recommended to take so much weight, but hey, you know, for me it works. And most of my things are plastic, you know, 3D printed. So they're very light, uh, uh, but you cannot really put more than five kilos of weight on top of that um, star tracker, but it is a very good, beginner star tracker because you can put double a batteries in it take it to a field put your lightweight camera and start taking pictures it'll track automatically you don't have to connect it to a computer or anything so this is my fourth thing that you need to have if you're serious with with astrophotography is a star tracker mine is a star adventure from skywatcher so the last thing that you will you would want to buy is a telephoto lens or a telescope, right? Because you have to start big in astrophotography to go small. And what is what I mean by big and small is you have to start with big chunks of sky, and once you understand where they are and um, and how to maneuver it or you know track it, and then you can go to the narrow part of the sky. And to go narrow, you have to have a telescope or a telephoto lens. Um, so this is the last thing I would recommend. Once you mastered the first few things, the first four things, you can start taking pictures of the uh, narrow fields. Uh, the things that I do is my maximum focal length is 500 millimeters. And I showed you what, what is possible with that kind of focal length. So that's the gear. Those are the gear that I would recommend if you're starting out and getting into astrophotography. And after you understand uh, or you have the gears, start taking pictures, you need to understand image processing because astrophotography is 50% taking the picture and 50% okay. processing the pictures. Okay, so a lot of a lot of astronomers or astrophotographers would post image that is not taken by them. They processed it. And that is a big part because you have to put in so much effort into processing an image um, mm -hmm. that it, it becomes its own art. Um, so there, there are three uh, things that you keep that you have to keep in mind for image processing, mm -hmm. um, at least to me. It's pre-processing, processing, and post-processing. So, mm -hmm. so what is pre-processing? Sorry, I, I moved too quickly. So pre-processing is, uh, pre is the things that you do during uh, the imaging session. All right. okay. So uh, in astrophotography, especially in deep sky, deep sky astrophotography, 
you don't just take the light images. You don't just take in the light data. You have to capture the dark as well. So mm -hmm. what is dark, you ask? Say you're taking one minute long exposures at, at 600, 1600 ISO. Okay. Um, yeah. After you take that one minute of exposure and you take 100 of it, you have 100 minutes of data. Those data will have a lot of heat noise in it because yeah. atmospheric heat, your sensor is heating up because it is an electronic device. It is connected to a battery. It is generating heat. So uh, because, because of the heat, it will register a lot of false data, which is basically is noise. OK, um, so you have to take a lot of images to cancel those noise. But there are some uh, noise that is that is sensitive to a certain temperature. Say your outside temperature is 25 degrees. Right? You imaged under 25 degrees of ambient temperature. After your light imaging session is done, you have to use the same ISO and same exposure, cover your telescope or your lens, and take the same one minute long exposures, but these, these are called dark frames. So you just expose, you, you're ended up with dark images. So these are called calibration frames. All right, so here is the dark frame. There's this other kind of frames called the bias frames. These are the fixed noises, like the hot pixels or you know the camera uh, sensor defects that is fixed in every images. It is called bias frames. It is basically the same ISO, but the images are taken at maximum charge speed. Say your camera can go one one four thousandth of a second. So okay. you just take say 30 or 40 those frames. But also, you know, your telescope needs to be covered up. Mm -hmm. So these are bias frames. And then comes flat frames. So what are flat frames? Uh, as photographers, a lot of you might know what vignetting is. Um, and sensor dust and lens dust is. Uh, sometimes we have to go to camera raw and fix it, but in astrophotography it's kind of uh, a pain because you're taking hundreds of images and all those defects are present in all your images. So what we do is we take fast exposure at the same ISO, put a bright screen or light source in front of our telescope and take flat frames. All right. Mm -hmm. We take those flat frames at the same focal length and the same uh, focus. Okay, so that flat light, say you put on put a um, iPad screen on on top of it, and uh, it is completely white. You take fast uh, images, and what you are doing is basically uh, gathering information about your image train your okay. lenses, your vignetting, the edges would be darker and the dust on your sensor would be visible in those white images. And when you capture 30 or 40 of them, average it out, then you have what you call a dust removal um, image or dust calibration image. We call it flat mm -hmm. images. So when you calibrate all these four kind of images, the dark frames, the light frames, the bias frames and the flat frames, Mm -hmm. You calibrate them and put them all together, and then you're uh, left with the data, the data frame. This is what your processed image is. Okay, okay. your pre uh, your pre processing is collecting those um, those uh, your calibration data. frames. Yeah. Processing is combining all those calibration frames and ca coming out with the uh, raw data, you know, yeah. your calibrated data. And post-processing is, post-processing is where you take it to a software like Photoshop or PixInsight for the advanced mm -hmm. people out there. Mm -hmm. And then you start playing with the, the colors, saturation. Um, you can do some cosmetic change because the sky is not always even. There are light yeah. pollution coming from a certain part of the sky. Say so you have yeah. a city in the east. All right, and it is emitting a lot of light. So when you take an image uh, of, of some Eastern object, the bottom of your image would be lighter than the top of your image. So you have to calibrate that um, using some techniques. Uh, there are some processing techniques that you have to calibrate those things out. Um, so 
that part comes into post-processing. So okay. you clean up your image, uh, tweak the channels, tweak the colors, mm -hmm. maybe sharpen it a little bit, remove mm -hmm. the stars or make them smaller so they don't look oversaturated. Uh, the image doesn't look oversaturated with stars. So okay. once all that is done, you're left with uh, your astrophoto. Okay. <laughs> and for, and for um, here's a list of softwares that you, that you use to do that. So mm -hmm. for processing, mm -hmm. we use uh, Deep Sky Stacker for Deep Sky Images. Mm -hmm. We use Auto Stacker um, and mm -hmm. Registex for mm -hmm. solar system objects. All right. So okay. if you're taking pictures of the sun, the moon, the planets, we'd stack the frames using Auto Stacker and we would mm -hmm. use, excuse me, use Registex uh, mm -hmm. to sharpen those images. So we are left with very crispy looking lunar or planetary data or solar data. And for cross-processing, I just use Photoshop because I've been using this for decades and I love it. Um, I don't have any plan to change it unless I get into Pixinsight. Pixinsight is like the most advanced um, astrophotography uh, software out there like for, for image processing uh, mm -hmm. for consumers. So it is like the hassle ball of um, has a blood of um, image processing software, but Photoshop does pretty good for me, and um, uh, I use that. And uh, yeah, so that's basically how um, how I process my images. And I hope I was able to give you an overview about how these images are taken and what software or gears you need to have to start your own astrophotography journey. So okay. we can get into questions now. Uh, all right uh, so thank you it was it was definitely a you know we had one or two uh, astro sessions before but it was more on the photography part of it but you know this is the first time i'm coming across somebody who built a, a, a telescope by himself as a child and then fall in love with the uh, sky and then again took a break and again getting into this and uh, you know your journey itself is a story so thank you for sharing it with us now when it comes absolutely to yeah it was really it i mean you know i enjoyed every bit of it it's cool so we have thank you it's pretty long and i hope you didn't get or my or our audience didn't get too bored um, I mean, see, yeah. the thing is, uh, our audience are like, uh, you know, some of them will be on live right now, but most of the people watch it later. So that's not an issue. So the first question what we got is from uh, graphite and paper. How do you focus during eclipse uh, through uh, the live view? So it's the question. Yes. Uh, so during the eclipse, um, I mean, you can still see the sun. I would use a solar filter um, yeah. because if you, you know, use your naked telescope without any filter, you're going to burn either your eyes or your um, camera sensor. So camera sensor. I'm assuming you're taking picture, uh, so your mm -hmm. camera sensor would be gone. So mm -hmm. what I would do to focus is put a solar filter, and mm -hmm. when the eclipse started or before it started, I would focus mm -hmm. it on a sunspot. Um, okay. And, or the disk, sometimes the sun is really, you know, spotless. So what do you do? Okay. Um, so you try to find the edge and try to make the edge as clean as possible. And then okay. when the eclipse happens, your focus okay. is locked. You have to also have a way to lock your focus. If you're using a camera lens, tape it up. If you're using okay. a telescope, you know, screw it in so it doesn't okay. move around. All right. So the second question, uh, second is a hello from Ratish, and he sent a big heart as well. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, the the third is again from graphite and paper. Uh, how do you? I think we already spoke about it. How do you keep your device temperature in control during long exposure? I can't. All right. Um, so I, I'm using um, this this camera right over here. Yeah. So it's the Sony, oh, uh, sorry, um, Canon yeah. uh, 600D, um, mm -hmm. Astro Mod Modified, and it doesn't have any cooling. So mm -hmm. I actually experimented. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find something. Just let me see. Okay. So <laughs> this is going to look like a bomb or something, but it's not. It's a cooler. So I experimented with uh, a cooling 
device like this. It's a Peltier cooler with a fan, with some circuitry. Um, it does work, but my my 3D printer kind of got out of order and I can't fix mm -hmm. it right now. So this project is still hanging, but mm -hmm. it is possible to use devices like this, a DIY device like this to cool the back of your camera. But it's not going to do me any much good. Like I can get the temperature down to say if I'm if my ambient temperature is 30 degrees, mm -hmm. maybe I can get it down to 25 to 20 degrees. It's not very useful. And if mm -hmm. there's some conversation happening inside the camera, you mm -hmm. lose your camera. So, you know, I just have to deal with the noise, uh, with taking a lot of exposures, you know, doing okay. the calibration print properly. And that's how I deal with noise. And I cannot really do anything about uh, sensor temperature. But I want to buy like a proper astrophotography camera, uh, soon okay. dedicated astro, astro yeah. camera. So I don't have to deal with temperature or noise anymore. I'm done with it. Can't mm -hmm. wait. So I think, uh, so your answer in one way, yes, an external device can help to some extent, but the best option is going to be getting the dedicated camera for it. So once you're going to use Absolutely. dedicated camera, you think uh, the temperature is not going to be an issue. No. Uh, okay. With a dedicated camera, your sensor is kept at constant temperature. Say you're mm -hmm. imaging at negative 5 degrees or 10 degrees Celsius. Your mm -hmm. camera sensor will, will be negative 10 throughout the session. And okay. you don't have to take the dark frames right after your session. You can go home, chill out, you know, pet your cat, and then mm -hmm. you know, tell your camera to get uh, get go back to that temperature and start mm -hmm. taking the dark frames. So uh, it is very convenient. Um, so if you can get a dedicated astronomy camera, mm -hmm. that is the way to do it. Go for it. Great. And he is, I mean, same graphite and paper. He's quite surprised with. Uh, your pictures of Lagoon Nebula. So that's uh, that's again a compliment for you. Then Raymond said hi. Oh, thank you. Uh, then Aquatronics uh, said spectacular. Uh, then uh, uh, then somebody was asking for. Then Murugan was asking for your Insta handle, which I have already shared. Uh, then. Uh, a Venus space shift. So yeah, that was even I was surprised, you know, when you were explaining that part of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, again, it's very interesting what's out there, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, I I, I have absolutely no idea about uh, uh, the stars or as any of what you said. But for me, I was watching a movie. <laughs> it was beautiful. Uh, yeah, it was the same for me. I had no idea about, you know, all these things were out there. And once I started uh, to see it for myself, I'm like, ah, they were not lying. The scientists were not lying. <laughs> well, these colors, again, yeah, of course, I have seen once or twice. I did my, uh, try to learn a little bit about Astro and uh, get into M Milky Way. That itself was surprising for me, but then seeing this red color and this blue and the green, it's like magical. <laughs> yeah, you have to do some operations on your sensor though, but yeah, it's worth it. So that's why buy the cheapest camera that you can get secondhand and yeah. then operate on it. If you lose it, you lose maybe a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, but at least you're not destroying your thousand dollar camera. Oh my God, mine was a, a disaster experience. In fact, we were shooting in 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 the dunes in in um, uh, in Dubai. So what we did, uh, yeah. we were a group of people. We kept the camera on um, a tripod and um, put the exposure. Everything everything uh, did it in the proper way. And then I think up around two or three o'clock, we thought we will sleep for a while. So I was sleeping inside the vehicle and the rest of the people, we were a group, as I mentioned, you know, some of them were sleeping in the vehicle, some of them were sleeping in a tent. So mm -hmm. middle of maybe around three o'clock or four o'clock, there was a pretty big sandstorm. I didn't know everybody was fast asleep. I think uh, it was quite difficult, but uh, it they everyone did. And when we woke up, the whole camera yeah. was covered with sand the whole damn camera and it took us for all of us to use some air pump to clean up the camera and it took more than two three hours we didn't show the camera to the 
uh, you know, some of us got it from Nikon to do some experiments, some got it from Canon. So nobody say a word about it till this time. We clean it up and <laughs> give it back. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that's the bane of photography, right? So you have yeah. to fight the element. Here's yeah. another interesting fact. You see these bands? Yes. This orange band? Yes. So these are dew heaters. So okay. in ast astronomy or astrophotography, our element, our evil element is humidity. All right. Okay. So uh, when we are shooting under the night sky for hours, uh, our lens would fog up. If you okay. ever tried it, like your lens would get all foggy and the okay. images would be all blurry. Yeah. So these are heaters. These are like heating pads, but for lenses. So we wrap okay. it on our camera, uh, on our lenses. And this okay. basically uh, raises the temperature of the objective lens a couple of degrees. Okay. So dew okay. doesn't form. So yeah, I mean, without this, my whole like uh, in, in the in the summertime or even in the winter winter time, when I image, especially in the house that I'm living in right now, mm -hmm. what happens is after two hours or three hours of imaging, mm -hmm. I go up on my rooftop and I see my mm -hmm. whole telescope like drenched in water. Mm -hmm. So it is like filled with dew. I'm like, oh my god! Like if any of this gets into my camera. Mm, you're um, dead. You know, <laughs> I have to. No, I'm not dead. I just have to like get another <laughs> one and operate on it. Yeah. So it's not fun. So yeah, we're Why like element benders. <laughs> yeah. Now Murugan again, I think she had the same um, opinion about the show. Enjoyed every bit. Thank you. Um, oh, setting an observatory um, at home uh, with a beginner telescope. That's from his side. Fantastic. That's great. I, I dream of having an observatory at some point. I actually have plans to do it in this house. There's, there might be a possibility, uh -huh. but let's see. Uh, okay. If my mount <laughs> appears in the next century or something. OK. Um, yeah. Again, Sriraj mentioned that it, it's an amazing session and uh, he have a question. Uh, he's asking if you can suggest a star tracker for beginners. Uh, come again? Uh, a suggest star a star tracker. tracker. Yeah, for beginners. Okay. Um, this one, uh, Star Adventure from Skywatcher. Um, mm -hmm. this, this retails for $450-ish. Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing, the, the star tracker, the counterweight, the plate and everything, um, okay. you have to buy the tripod separately, but the mount itself costs that much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a good starting point because mm -hmm. you don't want a bad star tracker, you know, you can grow with it. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I could put a camera and a wide angle lens and use this. I can put a telescope on it and use this. So it's very mm -hmm. flexible. Um, mm -hmm. It is not computerized. You don't have to hook it up to a computer or anything. It's very easy to use once you understand how it works. So I would okay. suggest this uh, for beginners. There mm -hmm. are there is a smaller version that mm -hmm. has lower payload. You mm -hmm. can get that, but eh, I don't know. Uh, lower payload might be interesting to get some um, Milky Way pictures, but you're locked with that. You know, okay. uh, there's very little room to grow. And as so, if you are serious about it, you want to spend mm -hmm. money on it, mm -hmm. like get this first, you know, save up mm -hmm. if you don't have the money. And mm -hmm. um, if you want to start, then you don't even have to have any of this. A mm -hmm. tripod, a decent tripod. I have a plastic one and I use that uh, for the first image I took. And mm -hmm. a camera, a very cheap camera and a wide, a wide angle lens. Put it together, take a bunch of pictures, stack them, edit them. Mm -hmm. There you have it, your astrophoto. If you yeah. if you like the taste of blood, mm -hmm. go buy this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally understand. This is something we suggest for uh, wildlife as well. Don't invest in you know bigger lenses in the beginning or the bigger cameras. You first give it one or two. We suggest one or two years into the field so that you feel that you have the pulse for it or you have the. Uh, you have your soul Patience. for it, then only go for it. Otherwise, don't waste your money. The moment you purchase an yeah. electronic item, you sell it, you're going to lose some money out of it. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so I think it's, that it's, be it's better to get a decent gear, like not the cheapest, but yeah. something that will grow with you for the next couple of years and until you upgrade from it. Yes. Yes. So I think uh, that was the questions what we have received and the comments. So thank you so much, dear. It was really an amazing journey. And I, I mean, as I mentioned, it, it this was completely a different experience for me to, you know, see somebody investing so much time into something and you building a telescope and working on it and giving modifiers for that and getting into a completely technical, technical thing was really a different experience. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun sharing all these things and hope my cats didn't, didn't bother you too much, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm very grateful uh, for this opportunity and uh, hope we see you guys again. We are animal friendly people. My sister got 16 cats at home, 16. Okay, so I am... I have three. Okay. <laughs> one of them doesn't like another one so uh, i'm going through some crisis right now maybe the, your your friend can give me some my suggestions sister, my, sister, my sister can help you because your she sister. have them every day she got one or the other stories about and it's all it's none of these are something which we bought or anything like that it's all visitors right. i think now my mm. house is known for cats everybody who doesn't want a cat i think people are dropping it inside our compound and uh, my sister is accommodating wow. everything <laughs> oh what a soul what a soul that's she good. Is. she's an amazing person when it, and uh, when it comes to animals she you she kind of share a different thing anyway Thanks, dear. Thank you so much. It was really amazing. My pleasure. Bye. My absolute pleasure. Okay. So thank you all the viewers. Uh, and please don't forget, we are still in the COVID season and COVID time. So if you haven't got your vaccination, please go get it done. It's very important and stay safe. We'll come up with another interesting session soon. And until then, you all take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.